YouTube archives, which has actually been very helpful to listen to the seminars again, especially for, for teaching purposes has been very helpful. Okay, so, well, thank you everyone for joining and hello, and welcome to today's CDY lecture. Uh, we will continue uh, with our focus on the topic of particle acceleration and extreme accelerators. And today it is our pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Reveal, and he will be giving a talk entitled Particle Acceleration and Large-Scale Jets of AGN. Uh, Brian is currently a Max Planck. Uh, he's at the Max Planck for Astrophysical uh, Plasma Theory Group, and he's the group leader there. He received his PhD on the topic of magnetic field amplification and collisionless shocks from the uh, University College Dublin. And since then, he was a postdoctoral research assistant at MPIK, and he won an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship. He's worked as a lecturer at the Center for Plasma Physics at Queen's University in Belfast, and he has been an active member of HESS as well as CTA and uh, SWGO collaborations. He's also served as a, an advisor to a large number of PhD and postdoctoral uh, scholars. He's been a great mentor. His research interests include the study of galactic cosmic rays, active galaxies, exploring 100 TV gamma ray sources, and also where and how the ultra high energy cosmic rays are produced. So let us welcome Brian and get started. And as a reminder, we I think Brian, your talk is roughly 50 minutes or so, and then we will focus on questions and related to his talk. And then we like to have the last 30 minutes just open up for general discussions on any anything that's on your mind. Um, and then please join again. We have these seminars every two weeks. Uh, and in two weeks, we have Jonathan McKay talking about massive stars. Uh, so welcome, Brian, and please get started. Okay. Can everyone see my slides then on, on my mouse? Yeah, it's great. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Rashmi, for the uh, very nice introduction. Um, so it's been almost exactly one year since my last confession. Um, so talking on a very, very different topic. Um, so previously I was talking about Nove, um, and um, I was asked if I would like to talk about particle acceleration in large-scale jets of AGN this time. I think the, the main motivation for this was um, a lot of the recent work I've been doing in collaboration and, and mostly led by uh, Jishuang Wang, um, who's a, an Alexander von Humboldt fellow working here at Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics. Um, and we're working together with Frank and, uh, and Felix. Um, but I also wanted to highlight maybe a few other um, related works that might be of, of interest um, to, to many of the audience and uh, that people mightn't have, have been, been aware of. Um, and so I highlight many collaborators over the last few years, um, in particular Ji Shuang Wang, um, Zichu, Zichu Wang, uh, Guan El, who had not the, gave the, the lecture last the last fortnight, um, Laura Oliver Nieto, um, and then Andrew and Stephen, who were trying to finish our opus on, on shear acceleration. Okay, um, so, okay. Um, so before getting on to specifically large scale jets, I mean, I, I probably don't need to remind this audience, but worth stating anyway, that the pervasive nature of jets by here, pervasive, of course, I mean the, the, the central role that, that jets um, and, and jetted outflows play in astrophysics, particularly high energy astrophysics in general. Um, so when we have these fantastic images coming from uh, various new new um, uh, experiments and observatories um, of, of M87, and you see quite quite remarkably the impact of uh, the black hole, the central black hole, um, and, and its impact over six decades in length scale, which is, is really quite quite remarkable. Um, but of course, it's not exclusive to AGN. Jetted outflows also uh, play a central role in, um, in in gamma ray bursts. Um, and I think where my own interests lie in these, particularly in, in the TV regime, where, where TV detection now of, of gamma ray bursts is, is a reality and, and, and a topic that is certainly going to grow in the years to come. Um, and so understanding how, how particles are accelerated in these uh, jetted environments, the different possibilities, the different routes to dissipate energy, um, of course, is, is going to be a, a topic that we'll be studying for, for many years to come. Um, to go to another um, extreme, I had a, a long debate with uh, Ji Shuang as to whether this counts as a large scale jet. So this is the galactic microquasar SS433, um, which you see the, the ALMA image here, which is down on, on subparsec scales and it, the, the X-ray jets extending out to um, a few hundred parsecs in total distance across. Um, 
and why this is, of course, again, particularly interesting and took a lot of us by surprise. Uh, this is a recent result by, uh, by HES, the HES collaboration, um, is the detection that there is something occurring just here at the base of the X-ray jets, which turns out to be one of the most um, effective accelerators in, in the galaxy, um, probably accelerate, but accelerating electrons, certainly up to several hundred TeV. Um, and we know the jets are heavy, um, so possibly accelerating um, protons and other ions up to multi-PEV. So this is really um, a fascinating source. And again, highlighting uh, the importance of jets and jet, jet outflows. Um, so to get a, a deeper understanding, of course, um, we also need to attack this, this problem from, from many, many directions. Um, and numerical simulations are really advancing um, in, the last, in the last decades or so, uh, particularly with the emergence of, of GRMHD simulations now, which are becoming increasingly pedestrian. Um, so here is a nice simulation by uh, recently done the GRMHD simulations of, of a jet. And the thing I wanted to highlight here was these nice steady, I can play it again, um, these nice steady jets being launched from an accretion disk, um, spinning black hole at the center, launching these jets and extends over several thousand gravitational radii. And so for this, it's a 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole, or 10 to the solar mass black hole, this could be on the order of several parsecs. Okay, so they, they're now um, able to launch these jets over, over quite large uh, regions, um, starting from very much from the base. Um, going to larger scales, again, approaching the scales on which we, we infer in observations, um, MHD simulations now not moving beyond the, the central region. They can't, of course, uh, get these, they, they solve this multi-scale problem, um, but wanting to extend out to, to 30, 30 kilo or several tens of kiloparsecs um, by a different approach. You just inject a uh, fast jet on axis and, and allow it to, to propagate. I mean, these now showing stable jets extending out to, um, like as I said, several tens of kiloparsecs. Um, and this, this field is also uh, developing quite rapidly. Um, so here's a really nice recent paper um, by the people using the Pluto code. Where on the left, you see uh, numerical simulations. And on the right, these are observations of, of various uh, AGN um, for, for one or two galaxies. Um, and you start to see these, these similar patterns just by changing the, the density profile and temperature profiles in the upstream medium or in the ambient medium, you can produce a whole range of phenomena that match quite closely to the structures that are seen in the observations. So this is, is getting us um, nice insight. But of course, um, none of these are really tapping into the microphysics, which tell us how particles are accelerated into non-thermal spectra and that produce the non-thermal emission that we see and that we infer in observations. Um, to this end, uh, well, it's useful to remind of, of where we come from. Um, and in some ways, these type of images, this is from uh, the 1984 review by, by Mitch Spiegelman, uh, where we see uh, different possible profiles for jet stability. Um, and these, in some ways, are, are, are more uh, valuable for constructing simple, simple models of, of particle acceleration and energy dissipation. Um, and I'll return to these uh, later, later in, the, in the talk. So um, a very nice review paper uh, that was, was put out a few years ago by, by James Matthews and, and collaborators I'm trying to present a somewhat unified or global model of, of the F-R2 jets, um, uh, radio jets. And so the idea being that you can have uh, this evolution of the, of the jet from close, in the, close to the launching site where it's highly magnetized um, and then it's accelerated out while the, the magnetization is falling off. Then you get these the jet extending out to somewhere where there might be uh, some internal shocks or uh, repollination shocks occurring somewhere out at, at several several million um, say out at, at beyond the Bondi radius, um, and then <clears throat> coasting along here in logarithmic scale, finding some termination shock, and then the possibility of the model that they were very much interested in is backflows, um, so where the uh, after the the, sh the jet passes through the the termination shock at the head of the jet. Um, you get these strong backflows, which can have uh, high Mach number shocks, um, reasonably high Mach number shocks, which in principle offer site for, for efficient particle acceleration. And then you have the turbulent lobe. So the idea having here that, that you have reconnection occurring somewhere close to the base of the jet, then you can have shock acceleration occurring at various shocks located throughout the jet, um, and then stochastic processes happening. 
happening in the in the lobes or in the cocoon. Um, this is somehow um, contrasted with um, with the observations which 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 we see um, the large scale jets, um, and this I think is the, the main the main focus of this talk. Um, and what's what's quite remarkable with the, these jets is with they they're extending over several tens of kiloparsecs. And what's quite striking about these images is that they are um, have bright X-ray emission extending again along the, the along the jet structure. Um, and if you just do a simple, let's make the assumption that it is uh, this a synchrotron emission that's producing the X-rays. Well, then you need to have quite strong magnetic fields and and quite energetic uh, electrons um, extending up to, to hundreds of TeV. Um, and the interesting thing about that, of course, is that the cooling time of these electrons is, is very short, um, on the order of, of kilo years for the same conditions. Um, and then if you just take, uh, even if they propagate at the speed of light, you know that they can't get more than a, a kiloparsec if they have a localized source, okay, before they radiate their energy away. Okay, so what one interpretation then of these, these jets is that there has to be some sort of distributed acceleration process occurring along the jet. Okay, so either there is a network of shocks, which again is, is um, not clear how that can occur. There could be lots of magnetic reconnection sites, but again, if the magnetization is low, if they're kinetically dominated, which we think is the case, for a lot of these F42 jets, um, certainly then that's harder to justify. Um, and so one might consider alternative possibilities. Um, this case is made actually quite quite obvious uh, for, for Centaurus A. So this is again, where the, the benefit of, of, of having ultra high energy or very high energy gamma ray observations. So this is the uh, the jet of uh, the inner jet of Centaurus A. Um, and what's more or less confirmed here is that there is an inverse Compton origin of the uh, of the uh, gamma ray emission, which then makes it fairly solid that this is this is X-ray uh, synchrotron emission producing uh, producing the this part component, the synchrotron component. Um, and just putting graphically what I said in words in the previous slide, um, the, the cooling is just too effective. Uh, cooling times are shorter than the evection timescales, and therefore, again, favoring some type of in situ acceleration mechanism. Um, and I thought it would be useful as well uh, to just emphasize again what, why this recent detection that we have of, of microquasars in our own galaxy being, um, say, uh, uh, nearby. Um, our ability to resolve and see energy dependent um, energy dependent behavior um, greatly increases our understanding of what's happening in these sources, which is currently not possible with with uh, many extragalactic sources, um, but perhaps something that might be uh, might develop rapidly in, in the next generation with, with CTL. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what um, we want to more or less, get to the bottom of is what's causing this emission on large scales. So if we want to produce um, accelerate particles in, in this regime here, so we're here on, on logarithmic scales, so from some point here where you're on the post recollimation out to the extending up to the to the termination shock, if we take it um, as, as given that the magnetization is low, so probably not magnetic reconnection, um, the, if there's no strong shocks forming within this, this region, then we're, we're limited in the options that, that can apply here, that can accelerate particles. Um, and so I'm gonna consider um, two possibilities. One um, is, is, is turbulent uh, acceleration and the other is shear acceleration. Um, so we're not the first to um, pose this. This has been around for quite some time, going back over 20 years. Um, the idea here is that the jet, of course, is not just the, you might think of this as applying to the spine of the jet, but the jet, of course, being collimated is, is maybe dragging or has instabilities occurring all along its edge um, and can produce a, a turbulent sheath and particles can then accelerate by a second order or stochastic processes within that sheath. Um, and so I'll explain a bit more about that in the, in the, in the next slide, um, but some nice work that was done several years ago by Royu, who I think is in the audience. Um, which highlights the uh, the how the two processes of stochastic acceleration and, and shear acceleration work together. Um, and so here you see stochastic acceleration. So that's classic second order Fermi acceleration in, in the turbulent sheath. 
um, versus shear acceleration, which has this rather peculiar property that the uh, acceleration time um, you naively expect it to, to actually decrease with uh, increasing energy. And I'll try and explain that in the next few slides. Okay, so um, particle acceleration or shear, particle, shear acceleration in a nutshell. So I think to my knowledge, um, and someone might correct me, I think this was first proposed by um, Bereshko and Krimsky back in 1981. And the idea is, is, is really quite straightforward. Imagine you have a velocity gradient going on axis. So up here, if I call this in, in the z direction, um, and this gradient is along the x direction. So this bit is moving up, this bit moving down. Of course, I can do a transformation into another frame. Um, but the idea is that the gradient stays the same, just the relative velocity that's important. And so if you imagine a particle that is in scattering basically along this way, so a particle goes up this way, gets scattered and comes back this way, then this is not terribly different than, than shock acceleration. You're just scattering back and forth between two converging flows. Um, of course, the opposite is, is, is equally possible in, in the simplest uh, model. Um, so a particle could just as easily be scattering back and forth between diverging flows. Um, and so in principle would lose energy. So in this sense, if the scattering is really isotropic and the particle stays close to isotropy, but distribution stays close to isotropic, um, this is just a, another form of second order Fermi acceleration, so it's a stochastic acceleration. Um, why it's of course very interesting is, is, is to note that the, the acceleration depends on the relative velocity. And so if a particle is able to cross more freely, so if it's effective mean free path across this region is larger, so it's able to move freer and freer across this region, in principle samples a larger uh, velocity gradient. And therefore that's why the acceleration time gets, gets shorter as you go to higher energies. Um, whether this occurs in reality um, is still subject to, uh, subject to debate um, because uh, the ability to cross a shearing flow, if it's magnetized, will tend to create a magnetic field along that direction, inhibiting the ability to cross. I'll illustrate that in, in, in the coming slides. Okay, so um, one way to start this, try to illustrate what's happening, um, is to consider a rather toy model. This is something myself and, and Andrew Taylor and Stephen O'Sullivan have been toying around with for, for some time. Um, and presented a few years ago, uh, but the idea is very simple. We, we consider a cylindrical jet, um, we consider uh, a rather steep gradient across the jet. In fact, we're going to consider uh, instantaneous, so discontinuity in the flow. Um, and then it's very easy to just run some Monte Carlo simulations, um, just let particles stochastically scatter and bounce back and forth in and out of this jet. So the jet is moving up on axis, um, and then the ambient medium is, is at rest. Um, and then we can give it a random isotropic scattering in the local frame. Um, the only question that remains is, is how to inject. Um, so in this regard, and um, this is where kinetic simulations have, have been very valuable in, in recent years. So I highlight here two, two works in particular, um, one uh, working on, on, on shear itself, um, on the acceleration at the, on the interface. So this is work by, by Lorenzo Cerrone and collaborators, where he looked at the development of Kelvin Helmholtz on the jet uh, ambient interface and the Kelvin Helmholtz rolls up allows the formation of plasmoids which plasmoids which um, allow particles to be accelerated up to, to quite reasonable um, energies that in principle then they could get up to the energies where they would start to resonate with uh, the MHD modes um, and in principle then scatter back and forth across the, the shear layer allowing further acceleration. Um, alternatively if you have strong current carrying jets and they can be kink unstable. And so these are some nice 3D simulations by Alves and, and, and Federico Fusa collaborators, um, where they saw also you see this initial stage of non-thermal acceleration um, getting up to, to reasonable energies. And then you can imagine these start to try to escape the, the jet, but then get back and forth across the shear line. Okay, so um, the bottom line is that kinetic effects um, can operate either internally or, or on the edge, on the interface of, of the jet and allow this process to get going. Just as in shock acceleration, we need an injection process. The same argument applies here. Okay, so um, let's do our simple toy model. We have a top hat jet, a cylindrical jet. We give it a bulk Lorentz factor of, of 10 um, with an in, uh, infinitely narrow discontinuity with the ambient medium, particles injected at the base. Um, and so what I'm showing here is a uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So I inject the particles, just random particles, inject it on, on the circumference. 
at the base. This is an, in logarithmic scale. You see particles as they start to get scattered in and out of the jet, they're infected with the flow, move up. And as their color goes from brighter, you see them getting to higher and higher energies. Um, and you can see that the acceleration is, 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 is quite effective. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to understand the acceleration rate, we, we had a look at, at the return time distribution. So particles, um, of course, can go on large excursions either side of the either side of the of the, the shear layer. Um, but they tend to, if it's a random model, they tend to have quite quite regular behavior um, because it's all so similar in energy with the random scattering. And so you can associate um, sort of a peak in the distribution um, with an associated boost in energy. Um, and most particles are coming with, they're getting quite modest kicks in energy um, from which we can in fact infer an acceleration time scale. So this is an acceleration time scale relative to Bohm. And you don't get this decreasing um, uh, scale because you're, you're, they're all particles are sampling the same effective velocity gradient. And so there's only one time scale in the problem or one energy scale in the problem. Uh, it's the energy to the one third. And then unsurprisingly, the acceleration time scale has the same, same energy scale. So it goes the same to the one third. Um, <clears throat> so can we move beyond the simple toy scaling model? Um, and this was part of the, the work that we did together with, with Andrew and Stephen. Um, and so the idea here is to try and construct synthetic um, synthetic uh, magnetic fields. Um, and this turns out to be a rather challenging task for, um, for these shear profiles, um, primarily because if you want to have this, this shear layer, um, in principle, you're not allowed, you cannot allow magnetic fields to cross that shear layer. So you have to have a, an interface and construct the fields in such a way that there's no field components crossing the field. Otherwise, you would violate Maxwell's equations very quickly. If you had a field line initially connecting, it wouldn't be as it moves up. Um, so I should highlight here that uh, while this is, is an approximation, the same thing would probably hold true um, on, on large scales uh, anyway, right? So you can have small scale fields that are getting across, but the, the net effect will always be to shear that. And so there shouldn't be a very strong magnetic flux um, in, the direct, in the radial direction across the shear layer. Um, but so what should highlight in constructing the fields with this property, um, we could be overlooking important physics in particular magnetic reconnection and other interesting phenomena could happen on the on the jet interface. Okay, um, so the net conclusion of this is compared to our simple isotropic scattering model, um, when you do the fields constructed in this manner, they're anything but, they're not isotropic at all. And in fact, particles tend to follow the field lines which have a very fixed geometry due to the construction of this, this, this shear layer. Um, and this has a rather nice, nice effect um, that you can visualize. There's these very um, beautiful, mesmerizing uh, uh, little, little movies we show. So I should explain what's happening here. So we inject, this is the shear layer. This is external, this is internal. And um, particles are injected moving outwards um, into this, this static magnetic field. Um, they're allowed to go back in and inside the jet. And if they hit this interface again, they're just absorbed. What I want to highlight here is that particles are not really diffusing, but actually go more what's what we call percolative transport. They tend to find these paths of, of low resistance, weak magnetic field, and hug along them. So you can see that the, the transport is not, is not diffusive at all. Of course, um, like all percolative transport, eventually it does become diffusive on, on very long time scales. But then this will impact the acceleration rate, you know, because you really want to get these particles crossing the sheath back and forth quite, quite effectively. Um, so then here's the case where we have very large coherent patches on both sides. And remember, they'll be incoherent with respect to one another. Um, if we do it with much smaller coherent patches, and you can see again, this rather, uh, this, this nice behavior here where the particles tend to hug along uh, these regions of low magnetic field um, and are not very effective at returning back to the shock or back to the shear. Okay, does any of this matter? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, so if we now do the same game, we plot the return time distribution. This is uh, the, the number of particles returning at a given, given rate. And um, we see that it's much more peaked compared to the previous case. So in the previous case, the random was very self-similar. Here, it's uh, it's also in a sense self-similar, but it's now um, much more heavily peaked than, than the distribution of the random scattering case. Um, but then this is, so the, there's particles are interacting very frequently with the shear layer, but they're not 
gaining much energy. That's the, the key point here. So you don't gain it. If you just drop this line down, the energy gain is not very effective. Um, but then this is offset by the fact that you get quite large energy gains um, for particles returning slightly slower. Um, the net effect is basically that you can enhance the acceleration rate um, quite considerably. Uh, so we get a much, much harder uh, acceleration dependence on, on energy. Okay, so if you imagine going down to lower and lower energies, you could have a much more effective uh, acceleration. I mean, this will play uh, quite a significant role, particularly if we're thinking of, again, our X-ray jets. Um, so if you want to have uh, rapid acceleration when you're competing with strong losses, then this, this will, will, will greatly enhance um, the acceleration process. Okay, so um, the question is, ah, okay, so before I move on, um, then the, the important questions are, what, what's the structure of the, uh, the spectrum and the maximum energy? And so the, the general trend is that this process will produce hard spectra because escape seems to be very, very ineffective. And so, and the highest energy particles tend to accumulate at, at large distances along the jet. So this, this is a spatial map um, trying to mimic steady state. So we inject at the base, particles then are advected up along the jet on this side, this is radius. And so you see, as you go deep inside at, at large axial distances, along the jet, you get very, very hard spectra. Closer to the jet, you get something more like e to the minus two, this is e to the minus one, and um, particles are falling off quite, quite rapidly with distance, radial distance um, outside the jet. And so the spectrum is hard, and the maximum energy tends to be driven reasonably close to what's the maximum possible energy, basically, to the Hillis limit. That's the, the bottom line. OK. Um, so. Question is, all of this was done um, very much in, 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 a, in an artificial construct, so toy models or, or synthetic turbulence models uh, to be able to get some insight into the, the physical, the underlying physical processes occurring in shear acceleration. Um, and so we'd like to move a bit beyond that. Um, and so this has been the main focus of Ji Shuang's work. So um, what Ji Shuang has been doing is um, <clears throat> running relativistic MHD simulations using the Pluto code. So here is an example. Uh, we have a, a cross section of a jet, so it's a Miley relativistic jet or moving with um, velocity of about 0.9 C, um, moving up on axis here. So the color scale here is the, is the jet velocity. And we can see if I just play that again, we start off with a nice uh, equilibrium configuration, but small fluctuations on the jet, jet spine interface start to grow. And we see these self-consistent formation of a sheath um, on, on, on the jet edge. And so if we average this over, over angle, um, what you start to see here is this is so this is the, the axial velocity as a function of radius. And so what you see is the these are um, we consider two possibilities: 0.6 C jets and 0.9 C jets, basically representative of, of F01 and F02 galaxies, respectively. Um, and so you have the uh, the fast moving spine um, still moving at about 0.6 C, um, and then we see this extended sheath here, uh, where the sort of instead of being like a top hat type profile, you have this smooth transition into the into the cocoon or to the ambient medium, and likewise for the the faster shocks, and the magnetic field profile starts to see various interesting behavior as well. You get a pile up on the edge of the sheath, um, which might play a, an important role. Um, and you see the um, the structure of the of the, of the magnetic field within the within the sheet. Um, <clears throat> so if we just take line outs along the axis here as well, we can work out turbulent power spectra, and it seems reasonably consistent with um, Kolmogorov spectra, more or less up to the limitation of what we can numerically resolve. Okay, so this is just getting to close to the grid scale. Okay, so if, if we have this, this idea now that we have this zone here where you can imagine particles where the gyro radius is very much less than this scale. So particles are magnetized in here um, and we can try to explore how those particles are accelerated. Um, so this is what, what Ji Shuang did. So if you take it more or less as assume it's a, it's a single zone, um, you just have an average acceleration rate in that zone and losses and then ejection and escape. Um, so Ji Shuang found a nice steady state solution, um, which has the, the following form. So it really just depends on the shape of the turbulence. So if it's Kolmogorov, we fix that, uh, the, the velocity, um, and then the, the, the profile, the velocity profile. 
uh, so the book velocity and, and its profile. And so you can see that you can get quite quite hard spectra as you go to very very relativistic jets, um, and um, quite so quite soft spectra if you go to more more modest jets. Um, and what Ji Shuang did, did quite nicely was take uh, existing data from uh, CentaurS A and 3C273 and was able to produce nice fits to, to the observational data, again, using um, using NIMA, um, built on his acceleration model, um, this, this rather simple prescription using shear acceleration in the in the shear lab. Okay. Um, and most of the, the parameters that go into the model are actually quite consistent with what uh, we would infer from observations. And so I think this was, was quite, a, quite a nice, nice finding um, and providing additional support. Okay, um, so that's what we think is happening um, in, internal. Um, if we wanted to explore if this is um, happening in a more self-consistent fashion and we need a much larger dynamic range, um, this becomes very, very difficult to do if you want to do something where you have a global jet configuration. Um, so what we're trying to do uh, more recently is, is really just focus on the, the highest energy particles and do sort of a top-down approach. So see how far, how low can we go and then accelerate up to higher energies. And so this uh, means we've been doing much larger, um, much higher resolution simulations of the jet. So I'm cranking up by, by quite, quite a, a factor and then integrating particles self-consistently in this self-generated turbines. Okay, so they're, they're still test particles. We don't include feedback yet. Um, that will hopefully be done um, in the near future. Um, but if we're only allowing um, these particles, we want to have them scattered self-consistently, uh, then we can only consider particles which have a gyro radius that's larger than the cell size. Okay, so this, this limits the dynamic range that we, that we can currently do. Um, okay, so just give you an idea of what, what, what's, what's happening here. Um, so if we start off with our initial conditions, so we just have this, this helical field, and we start off with our, our test particles in that helical field, of course, it doesn't do anything. Um, we know that there's no scattering, and therefore you can define various constants of motion and that they will be conserved. And so it just goes on a repeating pattern. There's no um, irreversible transfer of energy to the particles. And once you start to disrupt the fields, of course, then you can allow scattering and therefore you can allow acceleration. And so now the particles become much more chaotic and stochastic, um, but you can still see they're, they're, they're quite strongly magnetized. Okay, so the particles are still doing, doing helical motion, um, accelerating up to high energy. Um, if we look at uh, selection of some of these, these particles, you can see their, their behavior. And again, it's quite indicative that they're starting here at low energy. So this is increasing energy here on the left. This is the velocity shear layer in log scale. And so from the, the spine region in here, you see the particles are trapped in the sheath, uh, moving back and forth across this shear layer, the sheath, um, and accelerating up to, up to high energies. Um, and one nice thing, of course, um, whether this is real or not, um, is that there's very little uh, fluctuations out here. So you have quite a regular field uh, external to the jet, which inhibits um, strong escape, and which, as I'll see, will have the net effect of having producing quite hard spectra. OK, um, so what does the particle spectrum do then in time? So we break it into these are the low velocity um, shock uh, jets, and these are the high velocity jets. And you see the, the, the evolution in time. They tend to broaden. Um, so we start off injecting inside the jet with effectively one energy. And we see as they, in time, they move to higher energies and broaden. Um, so we see this, this time dependent acceleration. Um, and so these are our different snapshots. So if we now, from an impulsive injection, and so if we now um, just integrate over these, which then somehow reflects continuous injection. Um, what you start to see are these very, very hard um, spectra peaking um, at, at quite high energies. Um, and the, the maximum energy here, so if we just focus on the, the lower velocity jet. Um, we see that they um, can, can um, get within uh, a factor of order unity, uh, within an order of magnitude of what will be the maximum predicted energy. So if we just take a naive estimate of the Hillis limit based on the average jet velocity within within this region here, um, the average magnetic field within the same region um, and the initial size of the, the radius of the jet, um, you can see that you're getting very close to this. And interestingly, because the gradient 
of the uh, this this so freezing the jet at, at an earlier time rather having a steeper spectrum or a larger velocity gradient um, allows you to get to slightly higher energies as as you would expect with a slightly larger um, more more efficient efficient acceleration. Okay, um, so what we're thinking is that this might give us additional insight into the origin of, of ultra high energy cosmic rays. So if if ultra high energy cosmic rays are being produced in AGN, then shear acceleration seems like a, a natural possibility, um, primarily because essentially once you get to these energies, they can in principle probe the jet and, and the structure profile of the jet makes shear acceleration an almost unavoidable consequence. Um, and so here's um, the latest OJ results, um, tried to breaking it up into different composition. And so you see the light particle, are, so protons are, are turning over a few EV, um, and then progressing to, to heavier and heavier particles. So you're kind of hinting at, at rigidity dependent um, uh, acceleration, dependent acceleration rather. Um, and so if we look at the numbers here, so turning over at, at a few EV, you can see that uh, at, at 0.9 C, we, we would be able to uh, reach this quite, quite, quite readily, um, but somewhere in between um, could also work. Um, and so the, the parameters chosen for this simulation were, were selected to, in some sense, mimic what are, are the current observations uh, of, of Centaurus A. Um, but you could imagine if it was more, more active in the past or um, if we, there was a larger uncertainty in the strength of the magnetic field, for example, that we could shift these to the right, hinting that it might play a valuable role in, in the origin of the cosmic rays. Um, and in, in some way, this this... This conclusion is, is complementary to, to earlier work by, by James Matthews and Tony Bellan and collaborators, um, where they looked at uh, the possibility that uh, the ultra energy cosmic ray spectrum is dominated by a few nearby sources, particularly Sen A and Fornax A, which show activity that they may have been more active in the past, more high power events, um, jets in the past. Um, but they were in, inferring that they would have these acceleration occurring in these strong backflows. Um, here we're arguing that uh, an alternative possibility might be uh, in the shear acceleration um, due to the, 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 the jet nature of the flows. Okay, so um, if I can have the last ten minutes um, just to get um, make the case uh, for for the role that shocks play, because it's been um, mentioned a number of times in in, in also in in several CDY talks that. The relativistic shocks um, are not necessarily uh, relevant players in the ultra energy cosmic ray story in general. Um, and I'd like to make uh, the counter argument to that, that they can um, still be highly effective particle accelerators. Um, I think this has been brought back into focus, um, particularly in the case of, of the microquasar SS 43. Again, here, this is a, a shock which probably or may have um, a bulk flow about a quarter of the speed of light. Um, so that's certainly the inferred velocity of, of the, the, the inner jet and um, the actual velocity by the time it, 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 the shock is formed here. We don't know, but it's clearly a very effective accelerator. So surprises um, are always to be expected. Um, and so a question is, are relativistic shocks um, very effective accelerators? Um, first, let me introduce why people think it might be a problem. Um, the main argument is that for relativistic shocks, the downstream is 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 moving away at a sizable fraction of the speed of light. Um, and so the net effect of the E cross B drift or if you're frozen into the, stuck in the flow, magnetic field lines are being dragged away. And if a particle stuck on a magnetic field line, it's been washed away at, at a sizable fraction of the speed of light. Um, and so it was shown quite some time ago that if you didn't have effective scattering, um, then you really limited only a handful of crossings of a relativistic shock. Um, <clears throat> what, We've learned in the last decade or so, um, largely due to um, the uh, remarkable input that came from, from particle and cell simulations or the, the, the emergence of, of kinetic simulations of relativistic shocks, um, is that relativistic shocks can and do accelerate particles very effectively. Um, but a large part of the conclusions are that this only really occurs in, in certain regimes. Um, and I'll try to, to elaborate on that. Um, so a nice... Uh, overview was, was done back again over 10 years ago by Lorenzo and Anatoly, um, where they looked at a whole suite of simulations, looking at 
shocks, relativistic shocks with different mass ratios. These are, you can think of the electron positron shocks, and these are somehow representative of electron ion shocks and different magnetizations. Um, and the, the net conclusion was, if you have a low magnetization, so these this regime here, um, you can see that particles are able to generate quite strong magnetic field fluctuations. Particles become unmagnetized and can be accelerated up to the Fermi, Fermi acceleration um, can proceed at these low magnetization shocks. And this is, of course, particularly important for shocks associated to, for example, gamma ray bursts, where we know these numbers are very low. Magnetization is 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 8. Uh, the spectra that are produced, uh, again, uh, the bulk of the particles that cross the shock are thermalized, um, but when you get uh, low magnetizations, you start to see these emergent power laws. Power laws are broadly consistent with analytic predictions, um, which would tell you that for relativistic shocks, the spectrum might be slightly steeper than the non-relativistic version, 2.2, um, 2.3. And that the acceleration is consistent with, with non-resonant scattering, small angle scattering. So that's why you see the, the energy scales, maximum energy scales with the square root of time, which is a prediction that you would get from small angle scattering. I um, can just mention um, on, the, on the analytic front, um, we've been looking at this problem again. Um, and the, the idea that you get this e to the minus 2.2 spectrum seems to be pretty robust. Um, regardless, all you need to do is scatter the particles. Once you have effective scattering on either side of the shock, you can get uh, particle spectra which are, are reasonably consistent, um, and in particular consistent with observations. Um, so this is a collection of, of, of observations from, um, from gamma ray bursts, uh, afterglows, um, and you can see that the, the, XOR, um, the photon index is reasonably equivalent with an injection spectrum that, that's consistent with sort of even minus 2.1, 2.2. Um, so what is the problem then with, with relativistic shocks? So the issue comes in that this small angle scattering eventually comes uh, a little limitation. Um, at some point, particles that are scattering in, in these small scale fluctuations, um, the net deflections that they see in large scale fields, the, the, the large scale MHD fields, um, eventually win out. Um, and if you apply these, these arguments very, very nice, um, very naively, or uh, we can just throw them out at a Monte Carlo simulation. So we just put small angle scattering on top of a large scale uh, deflections. Um, and you can see if you allow this uh, Monte Carlo simulations to run very long, even in the absence of losses, eventually magnetization wins, magnetization being this gamma minus where the scattering rate equals the gyro rate in the large scale field. Um, and so you see this exponential cutoff where you, know, you reach this, this threshold criteria. Um, if you allow there to be additional scattering in the upstream, um, in principle, you can get around this. Um, and so this is demonstrated here. Uh, so this would be if you were dominated by scattering in the downstream, which is more likely the case. Um, but if you now were dominated by scattering in the upstream, you could extend up to much higher energies. Um, and this might in fact be a way out uh, in the case of uh, ultra relativistic shocks. Um, and particularly if you have highly uncorrelated um, or, or um, chaotic upstream magnetic fields. Um, this is possibly a way out for gamma ray bursts, um, but this really is a problem for, for AGN because AGN typically going to have much higher magnetizations and it's difficult to find this, this route out. Um, and so it's probably something else happening at AGN um, and I'll try to explain that now. Um, but first to show that there is strong observational evidence that indeed uh, you are accelerating to much higher um, much higher energies um, in, in, in the relativistic shocks of, of AGN jets. Um, so for example, in the, the hotspots of Pictor A, um, there's some recent X-ray analysis done by uh, Timapa et al, um, where they looked at the, um, the X-ray emission coming from, um, from, from, from the hotspot in, in the, the uh, Western lobe. Um, and what they, they find, again, is, is this type of profile, which, of course, is very reminiscent of very, very early models. Um, so where you would have the, the jet termination shock and then the, the, the onset of these backflows, uh, which you can squint your eyes, you can sort of see it here. Um, but these shocks, they should have magnetizations on the order of a few 10 to the, 10 to the minus 3 or, or more. Um, 
and the fact that they're producing extra synchrotron means that we must be getting um, electron energies of, of tens, if not hundreds of TeV. Okay, so so what are we missing here? Um, and so we kind of should be in this regime if we believe that the fields are are, are uniform. Then uh, Higgs simulations would imply that that they're not accelerating. Um, and the situation that I'm considering is that actually the fields are probably highly non-uniform um, inside the jet. And so when they terminate, one could try to consider different configurations. I'm going to consider this one here, but one could also consider something more like, like this. Um, and this is also quite reminiscent of what, what Gwenael presented two weeks ago. Um, so where they were considering uh, the possibility of having a null on the axis. And so the magnetic field basically being weakly magnetized in here and strongly magnetized at large, large radii. Um, and they found from self-consistent particle and cell simulations that you get lots of interesting phenomena. Um, of course, these are, are kinetic simulations and are, are very expensive. Um, and what we're interested in here is extending this to, to much larger scales, to, to, to MHT scales, on, on, yeah, kiloparsecs, um, where uh, you're really getting, getting um, away from, from these kinetic kinetic scales and whether you can get these beautiful von Karman vortex streets occurring is, is it's less clear. Um, so the idea is, is, is really quite straightforward. Um, you can imagine that shocks are carrying a current and if they carry a current, they therefore have, must have some support, some sort of helical field. Um, and then we can break it up into an upstream and a downstream region. So if you imagine what happens to a helical field, if it passes through a shock, it's simply compressed. Um, we maintain overall its structure. And then either side of the shock, we can consider a very simple problem. Um, so if we just consider a regular uh, toroidal magnetic field, just perfect cylinders, um, we can write this in terms of a vector potential, which depends only on radius. So an axial vector potential depends only on radius. And therefore, if you write out the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian is independent of, of, of C and phi, and therefore the corresponding canonical uh, momenta are also constants of motion. And in the local frame, there's no electric field. So um, we also expect the, the, the energy is a constant of motion. Um, and so if you have these constants of motion, you know everything you need to know about the particle trajectories um, in this region. Um, and what's, what's nice is you can write out uh, this equation here. So the canonical uh, angular moment or axial momentum divided by the, uh, the gamma mc. Again, constant of motion either side of the shock. And so then the only thing that matters here is VZ and rho. They must compensate with one another um, as a particle is stuck on a field line moving around. And these are what, what actually causes curvature drifts. Um, and you can show that if the uh, radius is within a few um, of the, the gyro radius in the not allowing for, for any pitch angle, um, you can show that the, the curvature drift velocity is a sizable fraction of the speed of light, in fact, approaching the speed of light on the axis. Um, and so in principle, particles that get into the downstream, if they have the correct charge, they will get these curvature drifts, which will drag them straight back to the shock. So if they go downstream, they're shot back upstream and then get stuck on these, these curvature drift trajectories until they get scattered in the upstream, and then they can repeat multiple Fermi cycles. Um, so this is what we again try to do, some simple Monte Carlo simulations. Um, we construct a slightly more uh, physically realistic uh, profiles so where we have a, a current profile which looks something like this. So a large axial current with falls off as one over uh, radius with a decent distance, um, which would correspond to an axial field which vanishes to the center and then reaches some uh, asymptotic value. Um, we keep our non-resonant scattering type uh, behavior. So we're still assuming these are something like viable mediated shocks. Um, one could build beyond that. Um, so the idea that I had in mind for sort of a global um, picture of how these shocks could operate is you would have a weakly magnetized region on center. Um, and then it's business as usual, PIC simulations are, are tell us that you can accelerate here. Acceleration will proceed until they get magnetized. Once they're magnetized, then these curvature drifts start to kick in. Um, and so then it's sort of reminiscent of what's, what's happening as, as Gwenael showed last time. Um, and so I'll just run this simulation. Um, so it's a pick simulation. So this is upstream, downstream. And you start to see part of this sort of doing random scattering in, in the downstream, but then in the upstream, they're doing quite regular motion. These are these curvature drifts, which drive the particle actually towards upstream. And that will always be the way because that's the direction in which the current satisfies curvature. 
um, Maxwell's equations. And so then it returns to the shock and then gets zipped back up. So every time it crosses the shock, it gains energy. Okay. And so the net the net result here, if I just plot, again, this is the full trajectory, um, you see that the particle just continually gains energy um, until eventually it escapes upstream. Okay, so the particles are set here where the upstream is determined, uh, the escape is determined when the gyro radius equals what we're taking as some fiducial radius of the shock, okay, or of the of the jet zone. Um, and so the picture is fairly straightforward. If we take a finite jet, finite size jet, we have two options. One, the curvature drifts are towards downstream. And in that case, it's business as usual. You accelerate via the standard uh, approach until we reach the magnetization limit. Um, but if the drift is driving you towards upstream, you are continuously accelerated up until you reach some sort of confinement limit where the gyro radius in the upstream matches the jet radius. Um, <clears throat> if you make the jet arbitrarily large, uh, then this acceleration process just proceeds and you get this very, very flat spectrum. And the flat spectrum is naturally expected because it's essentially escape free. Um, of course, this is an artificial construct of our assumed scattering, but you can see why, why that should be the case. Um, and then finally, if we just, instead of this was just injecting, these simulations were injecting on the axis where the magnetic field was weak. Um, if we injected uniformly, um, you just get a superposition of all these solutions up until you just get the uh, particles really on axis that have their relative secrets. Okay, and so that's where I can, um, can conclude. So I've tried to present the case for, for shear acceleration in, in AGN jets um, in, in a number of different cases. So discontinuous shear with random scattering, discontinuous shear with synthetic turbulence, um, and showing that th those two situations can give quite surprising different results. Um, gradual shear uh, with Fokker-Planck modeling, this provides a reasonable um, matching of, of data with, when you look at low energy particles where particles are really within the shear layer. Um, then on, on lower energy particles. Um, then if we want to look at, with the test particles and self-excited turbulence, then we need to go to much higher energies, um, which I think provides an interesting route towards possible ultra high energy cosmic ray acceleration. Um, but again, we want to go to, to much higher resolution simulations to really get down to looking at, at X-ray emitting electrons. Um, I have tried to make the case that relativistic shocks are still very much on the menu. Um, they still can provide lots of interesting physics um, and um, may also provide uh, a natural route to producing uh, very high, very energetic particles, particularly high energy, um, ultra energy cosmic rays. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to conclude with, um, again, these are open questions that by no means am I implying that anything I've said here today is the final word on the subject. Um, very much, these are still open questions and, and, and need much more work. Um, and I think one of the things I was trying to get across is that the structure of the magnetic field uh, plays a very critical role. And we still don't have a good idea of, or a, a really um, clear idea of how this is behaving in different jets on, on the scales that are relevant for particle acceleration. So a lot more work needs to be done on this, and, and I think will continue to be done. And I think I didn't even touch on um, recent X-ray polarization measurements, which I think are, is, is a really exciting uh, development. And I think we should have, it would be nice to hear a full talk on that. Um, so what process is sustaining the X-ray emission on large scales? Could be shear, um, but other processes could also be a flame or a reconnection. Um, one thing I didn't touch on at all, um, which is uh, something that, that Felix and, 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 and um, Apostolos in the audience have, have worked on is proton synchrotron radiation, which is again, is another uh, very interesting uh, direction, uh, which would, would really have broader implications for ultra energy cosmic ray acceleration as well, because the, you need very energetic um, protons to be producing this. Um, I didn't touch at all on converter mechanisms. Um, so I think uh, this is also a very uh, interesting uh, direction. Um, which requires somewhat more extreme conditions, but um, this is where you, you rely on, on, on particles converting between electrons and positrons and, and, and producing gammas and the gammas converting back to electron positrons and basically conducting Fermi cycles uh, via this, this conversion process. Um, again, need, needs a lot more work. Um, um, and then just generally speaking, what determines the maximum energy uh, for particles and photons in, in these uh, large scale jets? Uh, is still still unclear. Um, and so 
the, the, the age old question for, for many of us are interested in is, is the production of ultra energy cosmic rays. And so what we can learn from the multi wavelength data to really pin this pin down this very critical uh, physical problem. Okay, and I think I've gone way over time, so I apologize and thank you for your attention. Um, and I leave you with another mesmerizing uh, swarm plot, as I call them. Thank you. Great, Th thanks a lot, thank Brian. You. That was great. And Paolo's gonna take the questions. Thank you for the great summary. Yeah, that was a great talk. Lots of ideas to think about. Um, Okay, so let when we do questions, maybe let's start off with some questions about the talk specifically, if anybody has that. And uh, I guess, I think Anatoly got his hand up first, so maybe Anatoly, go ahead. Hi, Brian, uh, excellent talk, thank you, very interesting. I, I'm Thank you for putting this picture up in particular. I was, uh, one thing I noticed, or you, you mentioned is that uh, the uh, you get different spectra the further away from the boundary you go. Uh, that it becomes harder as you go towards the center of the jet. Uh, that was in a in a uh, um, generated turbulence, right? Do yeah. you get something like that in an MHD simulation, like this percolative transport? I've never heard about it before. It sounds interesting. So, do we get so in the MHD simulations? It's again we we don't really have the dynamic range to see this. I mean, if you look at, I mean, if you take a look at the, the gyro scales compared to the typical scales that are occurring here it's it's um there's a yeah a huge separation of scale so what you gain in the monte carlo simulations is you can really play with you can get a huge dynamic range you can play around with that what you're lacking of course is self-consistency in, in some sense but do you uh, expect this will show up in mhd as well i mean I it, would, it, what you're saying is that one zone models are just not good yes i, I and i would I don't think, I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, so if you have any, I mean, we know that particle diffusion, even if you take diffusion, simple diffusion models, we know diffusion is anisotropic, you know? So cross field diffusion is much less effective than diffusion along the field. And so if you have a large scale structure that's dominant here, you will preferentially produce, if, if you have a localized source, they will tend to follow, follow these field lines. Percolation, tran percolative transport is, is, is a particular regime where particles effectively have a memory. And so they know where, where or remember where they were coming from. Um, and this is very similar to um, uh, flood, flood, flood patterns, right? So islands eventually become, so when you have a delta, you have like streams moving through, they're percolating through, but eventually the water gets up and then you just get islands. Yeah, so this is like a transition from one regime to another. Eventually diffusion should, um, should start to dominate on, on large scales. But if, if the injection is highly non-uniform, then this type of regime could occur. So if you had impulsive events for imagine something like magnetic re reconnection events occurring or localized shocks along the jet, then this, this type of behavior certainly could manifest itself um, and, and could, could be seen on large scales. And um, this is something, again, my, my colleague, Gwenelle um, Santi has been looking at for quite some time for cosmic ray transport escaping from supernova remnants, that, they, that the, the escape in very early times should be filamentary. Um, and so you might expect in the first few thousand years to see this preferential escape along magnetic fields and then this transition with time to, to more diffusive light behavior. I don't know if that's fully answered your question as more roundly. <laughs> um, but I think we hope to do more, um, what, we're, what the plan is in the near future is to do much higher resolution 2D simulations, um, sort of axisymmetric 2D simulations to really allow us to get a much larger dynamic range for, for the transport and then to do repeat the Pluto simulations and put the particle transport in a bit more self-consistently. And we should hope to see something a bit more, uh, be, able, well, be able to say something more concrete on that. So Thank I'll you. get back to you. Yeah, uh, just one follow-up question to that, but then are you going to get the spine sheath geometry pretty much? Because you kind of set it, put it in as your initial conditions for the Pluto simulation. So uh, if you even you go higher resolution, you're going to get more of the same or? Um, I think the zeroth order, yes. Um, we, we're still going to put in the, the spine the spine sheath with, with, with it's axisymmetric. Yeah, so we'll do an axisymmetric mm -hmm. simulations. We'll still have azimuthal field. Um, obviously, you, you're reducing the number of degrees of freedom. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. 
Um, it might be possible to do a wedge. Mm. We'll, we'll think about it. Um, but I, what, what, what's the priority at the moment is getting the dynamic range. I really want to see what's happening when you put these particles to, to lower and lower energies. And particularly when we get to, because th we have the gamma ray data. And yeah. so we really want to get into the, the regime where we're looking at the X-ray TV emitting, emitting gamma uh, electrons, because uh, I think that would be the where you could really start to identify radiative signatures and, and, and get the real deeper insight. Okay, thanks. So I think uh, Evgeny had his hand up next. So Evgeny. Uh, thank you for the inspiring talk. And uh, let me start uh, from a brief comment. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a common misconception to think that simulations are uh, confirming the analytic predictions about the Paolo spectra. In fact, uh, the minus 2.2, the famous minus 2.2 figure is uh, dependent on the downstream velocity and it's for 3D, it's one third of speed of light. Yep. In simulations, in peak simulations, it's 2D and it's one half of the speed of light. And the spectrum given this one half should be much, much softer. Ah, and so it's I, not I maybe an Anatoly will comment on this comment. Again, yes. so I have a, so can I comment quickly on that? Yeah, sure, sure. So, so of course, that depends on how the pig simulations are run. I think you can get them um, with if you allow the scattering in, in, in all directions. This, this is possible. Um, but this, this prediction that 2D simulations give you something different. And I remember your talk at the CDY, um, and you were making the case, and I agree with the case that you made, that if, if you take a 2D simulation, you reduce the number of degrees of freedom, the adiabatic index should change. And then if you take the these, these analytic predictions that were made by um, by Yuri Keshet and, and collaborators, then you would expect it to be much steeper spectrum. Um, we there are a number of arguments against the analytic approach that that um, that Uri has, has 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 put forward. First and foremost, the the the, the approach um, is sort of doing a Taylor expansion about the grazing angle, which I think is the least interesting angle um, within the problem. Um, and also it's known to diverge around that, that point um, in, the, in the eigenvalue problem that, that John Kirk has been doing for many years. But I really wanted to test that after you after you made that statement before I, I, was, I, I was intrigued. And so we ran 2D simulations with a shock compression ratio of two. So we did the downstream velocity moving at C over C over two, not C over C over three and only allowed scattering in 2D, so in a Monte Carlo simulation. And we did produce e to the minus 2.2 spectrum. So we still, um, with the Monte Carlo simulations, we still produce something that's very, very similar. And so that would lend support that what the PIC simulations are producing still seems to be um, broadly consistent with what, what you would expect. Yeah, uh, I see. So your statement is that if you make scattering consistent with the dimensionality of the simulations, then it's fine. Uh, I wonder if there is an analytic uh, proof for that, or, or, or it's just an observation numerical. I think one could, in the in the ultra relativistic regime. I mean, you just change your diffusion, your scattering operator to be in one plane. Probably one could do it. No, I don't know if we. I mean, it's, it's it's purely academic exercise, but yeah, it could be interesting to, to explore. Yeah. Okay, then coming to the questions, the actual questions. So one of them is um, topological, another one is linguistic. The topological question is, uh, you see uh, bright spots in the jet, but the jet itself in simulations, we see uh, we see that the jet propagates all the way until it, uh, it stops somewhere around producing the lobes. Uh, what switches acceleration on and off to produce the bright spots? Share acceleration, it seems that it's it's a general mechanism. Why, why it switches on and off? So one has to be a little bit careful here because th there's no reason to suspect that the magnetic field is uniform along the jet. Um, and so you would, that could just simply be reflecting not necessarily localized um, particle distribution, but the localized magnetic field distribution. Um, but that, that's me just speculating. 
So if something happens to the magnetic field, this is your answer. I mean, an interesting to take take for example SS. Okay, so it's not shear acceleration, but take SS four three three. I mean, we see these these bright X ray knots. Um, there's no correlation between those and the TEV data, which again is one of our was our argument against the um, the uh, our arguments for why we expect it was the inverse Compton, so that it's um, producing the gamma rays in, in SS four three three because the, the scatterers are uniform, whereas what, what you see the knots in the, the X-ray emitting knots in SS433 is likely localized enhancements of the magnetic field. I see. And the linguistic question is uh, whether it's really possible to distinguish between turbulent acceleration and shear flow acceleration. What I have in mind is uh, I calculate the simplest, it's a simple estimate. I calculate the charge radius for a particle that radiates at uh, one EV given the magnetic field, and it's uh, billions of times smaller than the size of the chart. Then, uh, if so, how is possible to accelerate these particles uh, uh, in a, a really in a way of uh, shear acceleration? Because over the charge radius, the velocity difference is just tiny. It's negligible. Then if you say that uh, it's not, not only the velocity difference, it's also the turbulent fields which are producing acceleration for low energies, then uh, can you really distinguish between the two, between the turbulent acceleration and the shear flow acceleration? Unless you go to very high energies, when of course it's clear. It should yeah. be shear, shear acceleration then. No, I think, I think that's generally the case. I have to say that I, I mean, this this figure that I showed here, right? So, this is the, generally the argument that 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 um, Roy you and Frank and Felix were, were were putting forward. That again, yes, you it's the the energy dependence. So, stochastic acceleration or turbulent acceleration is dominating at, at low energies, and there should be a transition at some point to uh, to this uh, shear acceleration dominating. Where that transition occurs. Um, will depend a lot on the turbulence and the transport in the sheet. Um, and this, I think, is, is a complete open question. I, I really, um, this, this is, again, why I wanted to do the larger um, high resolution simulations to really try and get closer and closer to this regime that you might be able to see, um, be able to disentangle these. So I, I to answer your question, I, I yeah, really, essentially I, I do not know. I do yeah. not know how, how, how we can disentangle the two right now. Um, I hope to be able to provide an answer to that at some stage. Uh, yes, this, this question has a, a, a mostly important part, uh, whether for the particles which produce the emission at the peak of the synchrotron, whether these particles are really accelerated by shared acceleration or not. If not, then maybe we should not really call this shared acceleration. This is, this is the bottom line, more or less. Or, or you have some kind of argument well, well i think what first and foremost is we need to have some way of that 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 we we we, we know they exist we know that there's relativistic electrons there that are producing the x-ray emission so yeah we should sure. be happy that anything is producing them and that we can try to understand it we just need to probe <laughs> it deeper and deeper i, this, I yeah. this is true yes okay thank you i mean we study them because they exist you know like like cosmic rays all right, thanks again. So maybe before we go to Pasquale's question, uh, Anatoly, do you have any comment on the 2D pick and the 2.2 spectrum? Or Well, I, I think the compression ratio is actually three, not two. Maybe it's a different frame. Um, but um, otherwise... Uh... Anatoly, I'm sorry. In 2D simulations, it's definitely two. This is beyond any doubt. I think it depends on the orientation of the magnetic field. If you do in plane and out of plane, I think you can reduce one of the. Well, with, with no magnetic field compression, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always uh, it's always in plane in two D. Two D have the same it's, orientation. No, it's out of plane uh, because it's self-generated wide both. Magnetic plane. field is perpendicular to the plane always yeah. in two D. That's it. You 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 are not free. Well, so it's, it's, you are, you can have in plane field. Well, it's but, definitely uh, one half. No doubts. I think we're in, we're talking about different uh, yeah. frames. Uh, in the frame of the simulation, there's three, but we're in the downstream frame. So uh, it's, uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have an analytic expression for this. We just report what we see, basically. 
this was a very strange coincidence to me, but then. Uh, um, okay, it's good to think about. Brian that. tells that probably <laughs> that there is something deeper on this coincidence, yeah. Yeah. and it's not just a coincidence. I don't All know. right, yeah, maybe maybe let's keep going because we're running a bit time. So maybe Pasquale, yeah, want to ask your question? Uh, if Pasquale is there, let's see. <laughs> if not, we can go back. Pasquale, no. Let's see. Any other hands? If not, I can ask some more questions. But oh, I guess he's gone. So, um, yeah. Yeah. But back to Evgeny's question. Like uh, you showed, like the shear acceleration was giving the kind of right particle spectra. But in three seven three, all the emission is, seems to be localized in knots. And to the extent it's extended, it always seems to start like like a shock-like feature at the beginning, and then you go down the jet, it dies off. So what does the knot have to do with it? Is that somehow um, a shock there, and then somehow that makes shear acceleration occur? Or is there, is there a connection, or what is it? Um, or are you mm -hmm. infecting particles down that were created somewhere, and then um, the shock creates the initial seed particles and they sort of random walk down and get shear accelerated. Any speculations? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, both, both would in theory be viable explanations. Um, I guess the question is, yeah, how, how, how are you producing just this train of shocks mm -hmm. at several tens of kiloparsecs from the, yeah. from the central source? So, I, I mean, maybe it was somehow connected to, I mean, if they're still highly magnetized, you can get these repeating recollimation yeah. shocks is one possibility. Um, and then, but then you run into the problem again, how do these highly magnetized shocks accelerate? But then that's why I, I presented this last bit of the talk, right? That that maybe then um, on axis, interesting things could be happening that might might feed on. So I, I think it, it, it's, it's all connected. Again, unless you have really a detailed understanding and model of the, of the microstructure Mm. The jets on those scales um it's 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 difficult to make anything conclusive um so yeah just doing further studies and really trying to get radiative signatures that we can try to disentangle um or ruling one out i mean you know this is always the game we're playing right yep. yeah so i i think both both models could work um it would be nice to know which one um which one is, is dominating but i, I couldn't possibly yep. say it down there Sorry, okay, I, I was so, sorry. I was there, but uh, my computer ah. froze completely. I kept clicking on the microphone, and it, it didn't work. So, Rats. sorry. Can, can I start? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just had a couple of questions. So one was again on this uh, percolative transport that uh, you were mentioning, uh, Brian. By the way, very interesting talk. Um, so it's not clear to me. Clearly, the, the the range of scales that you have in the simulation is relatively narrow. Are you sure when you say that this is definitely not diffusive? And in fact, as I understand it, it's important that it is not diffusive because you need the particles to move across the shear quite fast, right? Uh, are you sure that it is not diffusive because you don't have the scales necessary for the particles to diffuse? Because so, they are too low energy. No, no. So we, we have quite a large, we have very large dynamic range in those simulations. Um, so um, we are going down, there are all the way down to, to gyro scales um, and, and below. All right. So we have quite, quite, a, quite a broad spectral range that we can do in those simulations. The key point is that you, you've completely decorrelated the inside and outside of the jet. Yeah. So they, they cannot communicate to one another within this synthetic model, right? So whatever you, whatever, think of a localized patch of magnetic field on the inside of the jet and a localized patch on the outside of the jet and they're shearing with one another. And so even if they were correlated at t equals zero, they're not at a later time. And so any particle that knows its local field on the outside, it crosses into another patch of the patch on the inside and it, it suddenly is completely decorrelated from what it was doing before. And so it will take, uh, it'll take a time for it to recover diffusive type behavior. Um, and the thing is that a lot of the particles will cross back over the shock before they have a chance to even reach that regime. That's, that's more or less the, what we, what we observe. So there is, there is a, an interesting effect and why you get this enhancement of course, is that the geometry imposes 
the structure of the field in, in a rather, um, it's kind of logical when you think about it because we construct the simulation by taking a number of Bessel modes and then twisting them. Mm -hmm. um, so that you, but you can't allow very long wavelengths to sort of Fourier modes to just propagate close to the close to the jet edge because then then it's very difficult to truncate them that they don't cross. And so what you do is you start damping the larger scale fields closer and closer as you get closer and closer to the jet. Um, but you certainly have the, the the small scale, and then what remains on the large scales is really the the larger scale helical motion or axial components. So it's really the the, it's the radial components just get get damped as uh, small as you get closer and closer to the shear layer. Um, it will be really interesting to see if one tried to do this self consistently with again high resolution MHD simulations, how this reflects reality, um, because that it is a uh, an artifact of of this synthetic construction of the fields, which again, took us a very, very long, or I said us, it took Stephen a very, very long time to get something that was was physically consistent. Okay. Uh, uh, I had a quick question on this plot that you're just showing uh, in this moment. So the energy decreasing acceleration time scale. Uh, isn't this just a matter of definition? Uh, wh how are you defining the acceleration time scale? Is the time for doubling the energy or it's the time necessary to get to that energy because the second cannot be a decreasing function of energy, of course. Yes, yeah. So it's the time okay. taken. So, so the, the physically reasonable thing is the integral over P of the time for its cycle, right? So that, so what you're saying is in fact that this is roughly constant or it slowly increases with time. Well, or, if we got this, so this this is this prediction of shear acceleration, right? And and I'm I'm quite still quite skeptical of it in general. And the, this is what I was trying to to get across here is it comes about because you're making the assumption that as the mean free path increases, I'm just seeing a larger velocity gradient. Mm -hmm. That is obvious, but but what I'm saying but, is but, that just, but if that occurs in reality, so I, if that occurs in reality, I. I I don't know, but what I'm saying is it, maybe you are right, but uh, what that means is that when the energy gets larger and larger, it becomes uh, easier and easier to doubling it even more, but you have to get there, right? So the time necessary to get there is the same no matter what. So in the end, the, what you're saying is that the acceleration time slowly increases with energy rather than decreasing. Yeah. So if you saw okay. d dt is equal to e over t acceleration, you would integrate that in time and yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Whether whether this oh, just, will actually manifest as if, it, if it's again done from bottom up. Yeah. That's yeah. that's that, that's a, still a big question mark in my mind. Can I ask one last question about your last uh, part, the last part of your talk, namely uh, when when you consider the helical magnetic field uh, at the shock. So uh, what you're saying is that the drift of the particle actually pushes the particle towards the shock in the downstream uh, part, right? And yes. that I understand. And you said that it is basically, if this is true, it's basically uh, escape free because the particles cannot really go downstream, right? What about upstream? Are you assuming that there is a um, uh, uh, scattering in the upstream section or? Yeah. So so that was, that, that's a limitation of what we've done so far. So we, we, we really just did a, very simple thing. We said everything is viable mediated. It's all non-resonant scattering. So every the scattering rate goes as, as gamma squared. So, um, or the time goes as gamma squared. So the rate one over that. Um, so that that that's the limitation, and that's why you see these very regular structures in the upstream. So if you if you were to impose a larger scale turbulence in the jet, then this picture would definitely change. You would diffuse out of the jet much more easily okay. in the upstream. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank well. You. But to be a little bit careful, this is all done in the shock frame, right? So you're not actually getting very far ahead of the shock. That's true. That's true. So if you did it in the upstream frame, of course, you're right behind. But so, but you would, in principle, you could get a much faster acceleration. Um, in principle, you could diffuse out to larger radii where the drift um, is, is is less effective. It's weak. Then you would get a much steeper spectrum. So you would get something back more like e to the minus two. Uh, I'm speculating. Um, so this is something we we could look at. Okay, yeah, I'm you. hoping someone else does, but. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions? I think Royo at one point had a, a question in Valenti also, but then you disappeared. Does 
either of you two have questions or Uh, well, I, I I have I had a question, but it was <clears throat> uh, like uh, not very related to the talk. It was a more general one, but I will I, I can ask. Um, uh, uh, Brian, okay. um, yeah. I was uh, thinking about uh, a smaller scale that uh, because uh, I believe you are talking about the region where the jet is already in the, within the radial lobes, but if you are closer to the galaxy and you have uh, particle acceleration in the galaxy and you have the population of cosmic rays reaching, I don't know, 10 to 16, 10 to 17 centimeters. Um, after the work you have done uh, with these uh, regions, uh, the, the, the shear uh, and so on, do you, do you think that it's uh, likely or it's unlikely that the jet can pick up, let's say at kiloparsec scales, on kiloparsec scales can pick up the, the, the highest energy cosmic rays from the, from the galaxy itself? So can you asking, can cosmic rays in the galactic disk diffuse into the jet? And more, therefore... more or less easily, more or less easily. Is it possible? Or it's the other see... way around, you, you, you discard it from your work. So <laughs> I, I don't see any reason why they should be um, completely um, excluded from the jet, right? So if they're, if they're high enough energy, they should have no problem diffusing um, into the jet. Now, how much energy they gain in that? So that's again, okay, let me come back here. That that was kind of the argument. That was one of the original motivations to to understand um, what, what's happening. Uh, where am I? Well, here. Yeah. Okay. So the energy boost distribution. Um, so the question. This is this is kind of a, a neat little toy exercise you can do. So if you imagine if I have a jet that's moving. Um, let's say it's moving this way. Yeah? So I have a jet moving this way and I have a particle in the ambient medium and it's isotropic. So relative to the jet, you're, you're a beam moving into the jet against the flow. Yeah? So, so you can imagine then if you transform into the jet frame, you get a factor of gamma. And if you isotropize then within the jet and particles escape the jet relative to the ambient medium, you're coming out with another as a beam against the flow. Yeah? And so you get another factor of gamma. So in principle, if you have an isotopic distribution, you put it inside the jet, you isotropize it in the jet, and then it comes back out. Then, um, in principle, you could get as much as a gamma squared boost. Uh, yeah, um, this one, one shot espresso thing. This is, yeah, so people have called this. I mean, this was known since, I mean, Ostrovsky and, and whatnot since. Uh, yeah, 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 Frank, of course. Frank, Frank now, the, what ha happens, in fact, is certainly in the random scattering model, and, and you get similar behavior. Particles don't stay in the jet long enough to really get that. Actually, most particles leave the jet before they've even gotten a sizable fraction of the of that. Um, particles that do get isotropized, and again, this will depend on the scattering, the transport, the properties, but in principle, then you're being advected up with the jet. Um, and then, uh, so you, you, in principle, you could get one shot at this, or maybe a few, um, but the maximum energy is then really determined by how many times you can get in, get isotropized and get out. So. This is something that's still, um, I think we again need to understand what is the nature of the scattering inside and outside the jet. Um, and I I'm still um, don't have a, let's say, a, a, a clear picture in my own mind of that yet. But my but question is, was... I mean, the injection problem is always a problem. Yeah? But if, 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 you, if, if, if a one shot can do it, then anything that gets over the threshold can in principle do it as well. Uh, but my, my question was related basically only uh, to the to the to the to entering into the jet. So I'm, I'm not sure I got what you said regarding this. So the, the question, putting aside this uh, potential gamma square gain in energy, I'm just thinking what is what are the chances you have you have a nice isotropic cosmic ray pro, uh, population outside right outside the jet, which it's let's say touching its boundaries. Uh, is it easy that these particles, if they get enough energy they will enter what what, what could be this uh, minimum energy because of course if it's 10 to 18 then uh, then you won't you won't get many but uh but i'm wondering whether you can have these cosmic rays in, entering into the jet whether they're excited or not uh, let's see but uh whether they can enter easily into the jet if they have pvs or maybe a bit more i mean na naively you would expect these jets to be carrying a reasonable a reasonable current you know not, not them terribly terribly high um, and if that's true, then then the, this idea that you have these helical fields surrounding it. 
And so the question is whether that provides some sort of cross cross field diffusion barrier to to exclude. I, I honestly can't say because the, presumably these jets are not going up into night quiescent environments. There's lots of star formation and whatnot going up. So there could be many ways. And, and you know yourself, you've worked quite a bit on how to get particles into these jets. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there's there's yeah there's many ways that one could could think. I mean, there, there's always solutions to this of how to get particles into the jet, how to get them in there at high energies. Um, piggyback mechanisms or, or bootstrapping. Um, I, I honestly don't know if there is something that would specifically exclude cosmic rays in the disk from getting into a jet in an elliptical galaxy. I don't know. Um, that's for okay. the people simulating elliptical galaxies to decide. Okay, thank you. I'm sure you have your own ideas, Valenti. <laughs> No, no, I was thinking just uh, putting aside these uh, things getting into the jet, like large things getting into the, into the jet, which may help to uh, put particles inside. I was thinking just of, uh, on, on diffusion, like particles diffusing and managing, diffusing in some way or another, managing to enter inside the jet, yes, by propagation. But uh, I understand that, yeah, there are many factors coming into that as well, so. Yeah. I mean, it's a question of whether if the jet is boring a hole and then somehow excluding the material that creates. Again, it's, it's this idea that if you, I mean, isotropic diffusion says they get in, but if, if you can somehow inhibit this, and I, I, I can't, can't possibly comment, I don't know. Okay. okay, thank you very much. All right, any questions? If not, I'll ask one more question. Oh, so, so there, there are um, X-ray polarization measurements um, of the like SS433 hotspot and as far as I can tell, it's quite high, 30% plus or minus all the way to the maximum. And in Pictor A, um, there's going to be a big XP observation, but in HST is detected 40% polarization somewhere from the hotspot. So the field for the emitting particles seems extremely ordered. Is that consistent with stochastic sort of acceleration? Are you separating the emission region and, and the acceleration region? How do you reconcile turbulent acceleration with maybe mess, messy fields with apparently very ordered emission, ordered well, fields in the emission region? Yeah, it, it's, I mean, this this was of course always a known problem for, for the FR2 jets. They always looked like the, the polarization was always aligned with the jet. Um, whereas the FOR F4, F4 ones were kind of particular. Um, and I think it's well known that they, they must have multiple reversals across that. So while it's preferentially sheared along the or the, the direction of the flow, it probably can't all be just monodirectional, right? There has to be field reversals um across across the across the jet. Um, and so I, I think this still provides avenues for efficient acceleration. Um I mean I think SS433 mm -hmm. certainly confirms it's a very efficient accelerator. Mm -hmm. Polarization measurements do show that uh, the, it looks like it's a quasi-parallel shock. Um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, again, high polarization, as you said. So I think there's, there's interesting, uh, th there's some aspects we're not fully getting. Um, yeah. If you take, I mean, naively, my understanding of what was happening, a supernova remnants for a very long time would have, would have said, yeah, the downstream has to be completely disorganized. It must must have very yeah. low organization. And yeah, Casse looks very ordered. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so so mm. something's going on there. Um, it might be that there's there's non again non diffusive behavior seems like a possible way out. So if you had something, I'm just speculating, but something like magnetic bottles that somehow just spit particles back from where where mm. they come from while you maintain just just focusing fields that preferentially get particles back at a, at a rate that's comparable to what you would expect in diffusive behavior. Um, but I'm just speculating wildly here. Um, we're developing new tools. I think I mentioned this before. I mean, we are developing tools to do full shock simulations with MHD and cosmic rays um, using uh, an, a new approach, not MHD pick, but MHD Vlasov focke Planck. Um, and, and so we're hoping to be able to self-consistently accelerate particles at non-relativistic shocks anyway, um, doing self-generated fields and hopefully get additional insight into, into what's happening there um, at that point. So if there's something that's 
limiting the amplification, the nonlinear amplification, or restricting it to small scales. Yep. Mm. I don't know. Hopefully, I'll have an answer for you soon. Okay, awesome. And Pasquale, do you have a thought? I saw I you. Mean, in, in principle, if the power is uh, the turbulent power is still uh, concentrated on the large scales, you may have mm. turbulent acceleration on the small scales without necessarily disturbing the large energy scale. I mean, in a purely diffusive uh, situation, um, the, the diffusion is get, of low energy particle is guaranteed by uh, low, uh, small scale turbulence, which carry a very small amount of energy compared with the large scale. So in principle, a large scale can be coherent on some sides, of course, and, and yet uh, you may have turbulent acceleration at low energy. Of course, the problem uh, becomes when the Larmor radius becomes of the same order of magnitude as the uh, energy containing scale of the turbulence, right? Yeah, and as is 43, it's the, the peak highest energy electrons, I guess, at the synchrotron peak that yeah. seem polarized yeah. on. One, one last word to Brian. So, um, but th that X-ray emission you think is that wasn't clear at the time, uh, like a couple months ago, is not correlated with the TV. So, is that it's not the same? The particle sources is not what you're seeing in X-rays, or they diffused out we, somehow, we, extended. We we don't no, it, it, they, they they overlap. Um, obviously, the resolution that we have with Hess is not as yeah not, not as not as anywhere what you can get with Chandra. Um, but there's no evidence for what we were arguing is that there's no evidence for a localized peak anywhere in the in the in, in the Hess in the in the very mm. um, So indicating that the, the the knots that we see, so W1, W2, E1, E2, uh, these are not localized regions of enhanced acceleration. Or let's say we we prefer a model in which they're localized regions of um, of, of magnetic field. Hmm. Okay. Ah, but you're you're asking if that's then somehow, yeah, contradicting with the the <laughs> XP. Yeah, yeah, I need to think about that. I'll get back to you. Then. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I think yeah, we should try and get XP talk because I think it, life is getting more interesting here. Yeah, yeah. Some actual constraints. Um, yeah, and and maybe or plus um. To, to, so people say quasi-parallel shocks work, don't work, but maybe Gwinnell's talk was showing maybe the shock doesn't have such a straightforward structure or when you actually do it, it's not like a plane has a symmetry and that allows particles to leak through and do things is that you wouldn't have gotten in a strict because you don't have the strict symmetry and all the conservation laws associated with it. Could that be part of the answer or not really? Um, so the, the actual topology of the quote unquote shock region or the termination region is more complicated it's quasi parallel, but not, and the field is curved, and there's interactions, and there's a cocoon, and various things like that. So, drawing a nice picture with a straight line across isn't quite sufficient. And then, when you violate that, then um, you you can make acceleration work. Do you think that's true, or I'm making that up? <laughs> uh, it's definitely true. Definitely true. <laughs> definitely true. Definitely true. Okay. Uh -huh. If you look at Tycho, there, there doesn't seem to be any preferred direction. Uh, the acceleration is taking place all over the place around uh -huh. the shock, which is probably related to the fact that the correlation length of the turbulence there is smaller than the size of the remnant. Mm -hmm. So there are regions mm -hmm. in which there are parallel regions in which are curved, and, and they, uh, you know, there are patches. Uh, and when mm -hmm. you integrate over the old picture, you, you don't see it anymore. On the other hand, for objects which like um, supernova 1006, which is a, a little bit out of the disk, probably there the correlation length is larger, and there you see the bipolar structure. Hmm. Hmm. At least this is a possibility. I don't know. Hmm. All right, very interesting. Okay. Um, so I've talked too much. So any other questions? Um, if not, maybe we'll wrap up soon. But uh, and we can open the floor to any general discussion about acceleration because we have several experts sitting in here so or felix any thoughts or i mean I would maybe just comment on that last point i mean i think that there's a uh, picture on this sort of magic angle that that people mm. were pushing i mean damiano was was promoting for quite some time this this magic 
40 degrees or 60 degrees, I can't remember what it is. But now he's basically come full circle on that and, and he's he's quite confident that actually highly oblique shocks are are, are effective accelerators and, and and injectors and accelerators. Um, mm. so I think this this picture is is changing um when you try to get closer and closer to reality. Um it's a nice expression. Roger always says nature's smarter than we are. Um so we're just catching up. Oh, there. Cool. All right. Um, the problem maybe just um, uh, the uh, kind of phenological point about all these acceleration uh, scenarios. So you mentioned one X-ray, of course, is important, just polarization, because just that, that could exclude immediately some of the models. But another thing is our X-ray are extremely important. Maybe not even X-rays even could go to MEV part. Mm. It's uh, maximum energy, maximum energy in X-rays. Depends only on the efficiency. If you know the shock speed, then depends only on the efficiency. If this efficient, then mm. it has a very specific point to pick. So when uh, Brian is saying that we could get this um, acceleration close to the Hillas uh, condition, Hillas condition actually implies that efficiency is close to one. Uh, mm. In other words, electric field is comparable. Yeah. Field. So in that case, uh, then um, then this and the, the shock shock is uh, uh, very fast. Then it could go. I mean, not even, not relativistic, even like 0.1 c. Then it it will go to the uh, hard X ray MEV part, have a cut off there. So that will be interesting from the point of view of these all acceleration scenarios. Look at the synchrotron spectrum. And unfortunately, we don't have a good instruments above tens of kV, so it's difficult. But at least uh, we should not see the cutoff in the in kV band if you have very effective acceleration and do very uh, large speeds. So that is could be uh, quite uh, important. Another point is this: this homogeneous X-ray emission. Even you mentioned. FreeC279 has some polar hotspots, but these hotspots also have the kiloparsec scales. And then uh, it still is very difficult to have homogeneous X-rays, these hotspots. So in that case, either this stochastic acceleration is not very clear what is that at these very high energies, maybe at low energies. So shear acceleration could be very, that probably is the best option in the sense that it naturally produces the long, uh, large-scale homogeneous X-rays. So that could be yes. just to, to, to always, uh, I think any theory developing is good just to check with this uh, uh, X-ray maximum energy and the morphology and polarization, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, I, I agree entirely. Um, Okay, and it's actually a lost track of time. It's ten forty, so we've been here a long, long time, and Brian is exhausted. So, um, so I think we should stop now and thank Brian for a very stimulating talk. You can tell from the length of the discussion it was very good. So, um, thank you, and okay, we'll see you in two weeks then. All right. Okay, thank thanks everybody. Brian. Thank you yeah, again. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.